It's the late 1980s, a time very different to ours, where the UK's government was run by the Conservative Party, whose deep divides over Europe had unseated the female Prime Minister. Oh, how times have changed. Also during this period, the IBM-compatible PC was dominating business computing and was starting to make serious inroads into schools and home markets. At this point in time, IBM is doing nicely out of this market, with about a one-third share. But the powers that be at IBM did not just want a share of the pie, no, they wanted all the pie. After all, IBM felt like it had invented the very concept of this pie, and thus the copycat pies really needed to be dealt with. Man, that's a lot of pie. So we're going to have a look at what IBM's cunning plan was, and what the competitors did in response. We'll also have a look and restore a rather interesting machine from this period. When IBM first created the PC, one of the things that set it apart from a lot of other microcomputers and helped it succeed was the open bus they created. This meant extra hardware could be added with relative ease, and third parties could make cards for the system. This bus was also implemented by every other third-party clone manufacturer of PCs. IBM figured that if they replaced the ISA bus with a new proprietary 32-bit bus, then the clone manufacturers would be forced to buy a license from them. So, IBM would make money for every clone sold. Also, those making third-party hardware add-ons would have to license it, meaning IBM would be coining it in. They were also working on a new OS for the PC with Microsoft that would ship with their new 32-bit PC, meaning they would fully control the software too. Called the PS2, this new PC would, as far as IBM was concerned, set a new standard for PCs. It would have IBM's new 32-bit microchannel architecture bus, and would also use the new OS2 operating system. It would even have a new keyboard and mouse connector. Ooh. It would be available with Intel's new shiny 386 32-bit CPU, or you could have it with the regular 286 CPU from the AT machines. How could IBM possibly fail. I don't know if IBM thought its competitors would just accept IBM's new world and start licensing the MCA bus, or if they might have a fight on their hands, but given that none of us are watching this on an IBM PC running OS 2, I think we know this did not go their way. A group of PC manufacturers who had become known as the Gang of Nine were not just planning on stumping up the money and licensing MCA from IBM. They had their own rather cunning plan. They would make their own 32-bit bus called Enhanced ISA, or EISA for short, and unlike IBM's MCA bus, you could plug a regular 8 or 16-bit ISA card directly into that slot. The Gang of Nine consisted of the following. AST Research, Compact Computer Corporation, Seiko Epson, Hewlett Packard, NEC, Olivetti, Tandy, Wise, and Zenith Data Systems. While almost all of these companies are now dead or very different now, at the time between them they sold more PCs than anybody else. In theory, the Gang of Nine consisted of nine equal members. However, Compaq was leading the group and heading up the technical development. As Ed Judge, one of Tandy's directors at the time, said, When you have ten people sit down before a table to write a letter to the president, someone has to write the letter. Compaq is sitting down at the typewriter. The reason everyone had been striving for a new 32-bit bus was that Intel had been working on its new processor, the 386. This new processor would bring to the world of the PC for the first time not only a 32-bit instruction set, but also a 32-bit data bus. So to make optimal use of this new CPU, a 32-bit expansion bus was needed. The Gang of Nine was very bad news for IBM. So far, all the clone vendors had simply copied IBM's technical implementations. Now they were coming up with their own standard and challenging IBM for the technical leadership of the PC market. To make matters worse, things were not going well for IBM on the software front either. The culture clash between IBM and Microsoft's development teams meant that the relationship was starting to turn sour. Microsoft's GUI add-on for DOS, known as Windows, was starting to make some real money for Microsoft as well, so the relationship between them broke down completely. In the subsequent divorce, IBM would take the code that it had and use that to form the basis of OS 2. As for Microsoft, it would take what it had and eventually use it to form the basis of Windows NT. So IBM's new shiny future was not looking, well, so shiny anymore. To make matters worse, Compaq released their 386 machine before IBM could even get their PS2 out. This marked for the first time a new Intel CPU entering the PC market without IBM being the first to bring it out. In a further humiliating step, IBM had to release the PS2 with DOS and Windows as the only available operating systems, as OS2 was not released until a few months later. It would be fair to say that the PS2 was not the bright new shining dawn that IBM had hoped that it was going to be. 
They thought with one fell swoop they'd take back full control over the PC market and dominate it for another generation. Instead, what the PS2 mostly did to do was illustrate the fact that IBM was not in charge of the PC market anymore. Most of us never saw a PC with either the MCA or EISA bus, unless we had either incredibly wealthy parents, which I didn't, or we were part of the IT industry at that point in time, which I kinda was. Neither of these two bus technologies really ever made it into the desktop market, they were more reserved for the server space. For servers, 32-bit access to either a SCSI card or a network card could make quite a significant performance difference. Of the two buses, EISA saw the most success in the PC market. Part of this was that EISA gave customers a greater choice of both server vendors and available hardware cards. Initially only IBM was producing MCA cards, whereas with EISA, existing manufacturers of high-end ISA cards started making EISA cards more or less from the outset, so the likes of Adaptic, Freecom, Bus Logic, all had high-end 32-bit versions of their cards available, more or less at the launch time of the ISA. Also, Compaq had a big share of the server market, and was considered the market leader prior to ISA coming out, and getting 386 first and heading up the ISA pushed its reputation even further. It also helped that their popular Smart Array card got in the ISA version from the get-go, with drivers for Netware, Unixware, SCO from release whereas IBM's driver support for popular network operating systems of the time lags somewhat behind. Eventually the failure of IBM's MCA bus was complete, with IBM moving to using the ISA bus in their line of servers and producing the ISA cards for RAID and Token Ring, etc. OS2 also failed to gain any significant market share, and even though the PS2 did sell alright as a corporate desktop machine, most of the ones sold were sold with DOS and Windows on rather than OS2. IBM had hoped the PS2 would allow it to dominate the PC market once again, but instead, the PS2 marked the moment where IBM lost its technical leadership of the PC market, and is about the point in time where we stopped referring to PCs as IBM-compatible PCs, and it just became the PC. When it became time to create the next 32-bit bus standard for the PC, after EISA, IBM was just one of the many members of the standards body that went on to go create PCI. It wasn't even the one sat at the typewriter. The only lasting technical standard that the PS2 managed to set was it introduced a new keyboard and mouse connector to the PC market, which stayed around for quite a while until eventually USB replaced that. As a footnote in the history of the MCA bus, once it was finally no longer made use of in the PC, it did have a life after the PC, as IBM went on to use it in its RS6000 line of Unix machines and its AS400 range. So, let's see some hardware. Check out this impressive lump of kit from the mid-90s. This is a Dolch Portable, a very niche PC, it must be said, intended for users that needed essentially server-level performance in a portable case. Now, while a lot lighter than, say, an 80s lookable PC, uh, like the Compact Portable, see a video I did on that if you click back a bit. Yeah, so it's a lot lighter than those 1980s portables, and even though it's bulkier than a laptop of the time, it probably weighed about the same amount because this thing's got no batteries in it. Uh, basically, you have to plug it into the mains to use it, whereas a laptop, you have to carry around all that battery weight with you. The main board's basically a server motherboard, complete with support for two CPUs, a fairly rare feature at the time, even in server boards, to be honest, and both EISA and PCI slots, as well as an onboard SCSI controller, which although quite common at the time on server boards, for your average desktop at the time, IDE was kind of the standard that everyone went with. This particular machine was used as a packet sniffer for real-time capturing analysis and network traffic. At the time this was a pretty high-end application requiring some serious computing power and hardware. I mean, check out this 1 gig EISA network card. This is a seriously hench card. I mean, it provides a bunch of hardware acceleration for traffic capture, which means that you capture traffic at the full 1 gig wire rate. This would have been a seriously expensive bit of kit at the time, and it's not surprising that it wasn't just refactored from EISA to PCI when the PCI bus standard was produced. Now, as this network capture software ran on DOS, and DOS didn't even slightly support multiprocessor out of the box, it has one CPU populated. But as we're going to run both DOS, mostly for games, etc., and Linux on this machine, so I can actually you know, talk to modern stuff over a network, uh, we're going to splash out and spend the whole four quid on eBay and buy a second Pentium 150 to stick in this bad boy. 
Also, we're going to buy it some more RAM as well. Even the smallest Linux distro needs more than 16 meg to work. I'll also replace the spinning glass disc with an SD card based disc emulator. Um, as while the disc's not died yet, the rubber inside where the arms sit um, generally tends to go a bit soft and squidgy and sometimes they stick the arms in place. Also, the original SCSI disc does make one hell of a racket. I mean, most of the noise that comes out of this thing is the disc, so do you know what? I'm really not going to miss that sound. One of the sad things about this particular machine that I've got is sadly the case is missing a plastic panel from one side, which is really annoying, to be honest, because uh, I'd like a, a full case. Also, someone glued this nasty switch to the back of the thing that is just not coming off without me damaging the plastic panel. But, as luck would have it, while I was browsing around on eBay, I happened to find a spare case going for one of these machines. And while all the insides were missing and the keyboard had already been sold to someone else, the actual case itself was in pretty good nick. So, I purchased that one, took a few panels off that one, popped them onto my case, and I now have a pretty decent condition machine. I've also added an EISA SCSI card with an external SCSI connector on, so I can add an external SCSI CD drive, you know, for that real proper 1990s multimedia experience. Who knows, I may even play 7th Guest later. Oh, me, probably not. This makes a lovely portable 90s era gaming machine, with an incredibly nice clicky keyboard, which ironically is why these machines are so hard to find now, as most people buy one just for the keyboard and then junk the rest of it. The only real drawback of this machine is the ISA graphics card that's in it. Now, while I could try and find a PCI graphics card that could certainly output SVGA, it's finally one that's got the internal connector so I can drive the VGA panel inside this thing. Now at this point in time it's just proving too hard to find a suitable card, so I'm just going to go with the isographics card for the time being, and if a suitable replacement comes up at some point, I'll buy it, put it in, and I'll be a happy bunny. But now I'm more sort of just a rabbit of medium contentness, which, you know, I can live with. Now we could do with adding a sound card to this thing, because, you know, games have music and games have sound, and I'm planning on playing some games on this thing, so... I bought myself a PCI sound card for a whole four pounds on eBay. Ooh, that's the big spenders there. Yes, a Sound Blaster Live. I picked that because it's got fairly decent MS-DOS support, so all my old games will work with it. Um, I suppose I could have gone with the whole ISA AWE32 full length card, but to be honest, there's not that much space inside this thing. We've already got some pretty hench looking cards in there, so you know, another four foot long sound card probably wasn't gonna be ideal. Right, let's try turning this thing on and see what happens. Well, no smoke or fire, that's always a good sign. Right, first thing we're going to look for is, does the memory all detect? And by the looks of it, it does. That's rather convenient. The other thing is, does our new SCSI to SD adapter also get detected by the SCSI card? Let's wait and see. Right, let's have a little muck around with the brightness and contrast controls. Yep, that makes no appreciable difference on camera whatsoever. Marvellous. When I was in the room, this did actually make it look better, but on camera, yeah, that's done nothing, has it? Mm. Ah, and the SD to SCSI card adapter has been detected. That's good. Um, I mean, if we had an OS on this SD card now, the machine would boot, but we don't have an OS on it, so it's not gonna. Um, so we should probably cut to some footage where I, you know, stick an OS on this thing. Yeah. Originally, I thought I'd install MS-DOS on this thing, but even DOS 6.22 has problems with disk sizes above a certain amount, which you can see in this footage, where MS-DOS just sort of, well, hangs. Hmm. So, I thought I'd give FreeDOS a go. For those of you not familiar with FreeDOS, FreeDOS is an open source project that tried to pick up where Microsoft DOS left off. When Windows 95 was launched, Microsoft decided they would no longer produce a standalone DOS product. That meant that users who just wanted DOS and nothing else were kind of left a bit out in the cold, but luckily the FreeDOS project came into existence. There, a group of developers decided that they'd create their own version of DOS from the ground up, and created a version of DOS they did. And it's still maintained to this day and supports more modern hardware than one would expect purely for DOS. You're most likely to have encountered FreeDOS when using software like DOSBox to run old games, as FreeDOS is the version of DOS that gets bundled in with that. However, it's equally at home running on native tin as well, which is what we're doing here. Now we've got this thing booted, let's try playing a game on it, and why not go for Doom 2? After all, that's what most people used to run on their PC. 
In the early 90s, probably nothing did more than Doom to help sell the PC as a gaming platform, as it's really the first PC game that really outshined what the Amiga and the Atari could do. Now we've had a little bit of Doom, why not try one of my favourite games from the mid-90s, Warcraft 2? Oh, fail. Let's try that other 90s staple, Duke Nukem 3D. Oh no, another fail. Oh, how unfortunate. Okay, so clearly I could have edited out both those fails, given that this thing isn't exactly live, but I left them in so you could see one of the common problems of DOS gaming in the 90s, that of owning not the world's greatest graphics card. In DOS, games have to directly drive the graphics card, and the way in which they did that is through the Visa BIOS, and each graphics card was supposed to have a Visa-compatible BIOS for which the DOS game could control it via. However, not all Visa BIOSes were equal, in fact, some were pretty awful. Um, for example, like this card, so a game should fail to start. Enter a tool called SciTech Display Doctor, and its wonderful little utility UniVBE. This little thing acted as a replacement Visa BIOS for pretty much any graphics card, so if yours was not the most compatible of compatible graphics cards, well, this little thing made it compatible. So we'll get it installed ourselves. And then we'll let the thing run, detect our graphics card, hopefully decide that it can drive it, and then provide us with a nice little compatible Visa BIOS that our games can use. Ooh, look, it worked. And we have a nice little bit of Duke Nukem to look at. Ah, Duke Nukem. Let's try that other old favourite of mine that didn't work earlier, Warcraft 2. Ooh, look, and that one works too. So there we get to see UniVBE doing its stuff and making our graphics card, well, compatible. Which is pretty handy when you want it to be compatible with your games. And speaking of games, why not try one of my old favourites from the 90s yet again, the wonderful Descent 2. For those of you who never play this, you control a little spaceship going around the mine blowing up other spaceships. I mean, that made it sound a lot worse than it actually is. It's, it's a really cracking game. Well, that brings us to the end of our video, and if you stayed awake all the way to the end, well, well done and thank you. We've had a look at the history of the ISA bus and how it beat MCA, and also restored a nice little cracking machine from the 1990s to act as a portable gaming system. It only remains for me to say thank you very much for watching, and if you like this video, you can of course leave us a comment in the section below, or hit the like button. Alternatively, if you hated it, you can in fact destroy my soul with negative comments underneath as well. And of course, it would be lovely if you wanted to subscribe to the channel, as that sort of thing encouraged me to make more of these things.